Hello, everybody. My name is Giacomo Savani, and I am an IRC postdoctoral fellow at the School of Classic UCD. It's a great pleasure for me and my colleague, Matthew Mandich, to welcome you all today. Uh, we, before we start, we would like to acknowledge the generous support of uh, funding from the uh, UCD Humanity Institute and the College of Arts and Humanities Interdisciplinary Research Grant. A special thanks is also owned to Valerie Norton at the Humanity Institute for her incredible work behind the scenes. As a way to introduce some of the ideas behind this workshop, I would like to start with this image. Some time ago, I had an illuminating conversation with my friend Nathan Rank, a special, special ecologist and conservation biologist. He showed me this picture and asked me to tell him what I was looking at. Naively, I say, a beautiful forest. He smiled and told me that, unfortunately, this is not a real forest. This is a man-made environment looking like a forest, also known as a managed forest. He then listed all the essential comp components of a real forest, what he, call, what he calls an ancient or primary forest. Stuff like an even canopy, great diversity of plant species, dead trees decay on the ground and snacks for dead standing trees. All of them are missing from our picture. And as a consequence of this, what is also missing from the forest in the picture is biodiversity. This is what an ancient forest looks like. Nathan is able to identify several different types of ecosystems in there, some of which are extremely small, squeeze into the underbelly of some of, of these fallen trees that you can see. So nature is chaotic, complex, and varied, while all managed forests are created through a process of simplification and selection. Only useful trees arrange in a rational way. Sometimes a similar process of selections happens when we look at classical antiquity. Due to the fragmented nature of the past, as scholars, we have a tendency to categorize, to focus our attention on key features that can produce meaning. These are obvious advantages and, and it helps to construct knowledge in a rational way, brick by brick. Yet, this process of selection inevitably downscaled the complexity of the past. Since relatively recent, uh, recently, the environment was certainly one of those features relegated to the background, to be background noise in our image of antiquity. Matthew and I are both Roman archeologists and we started thinking about an event like this back in 2018. Sometimes working on our, on our stuff, we had a feeling of det detachment, like if there was an ever expanding gap between the beautiful text and object we were studying and the dramatic reality of the global environmental crisis, which inexorably kept seeping into our mind. This workshop is an attempt to fill this gap, to give, to give a deeper meaning to the study of classical antiquity. We hope our speakers will contribute to enrich the image of the past at the a green lens to make it look more like a primary forest, complex, unpredictable, perhaps even hostile, and yet full of life. Thank you, Giacomo, very much. Um, speaking of that uh, hostility you just mentioned, uh, I think it's worth pausing here also to, to note how drastically the style and form of this conference has changed since our original thinking in uh, 2019. As we continue to anthropize the environment and push deeper into previously unsettled zones, we bring ourselves closer into closer contact with animals and pathogens that would have otherwise remained distant. In particular, deforestation, or the destruction of our ancient forests as seen above, has put humans in closer contact with a variety of animals and zoonotic diseases. Since unlike natural environments, uh, which are highly selective, an anthropized rural zone can be acceptable for a number of species, especially bats, making zones such, such zones as these risky spaces for zoonotic transmission. While the exact origins of COVID-19 remain unknown, it is very likely that it originated in bats like many other coronaviruses. So, as we continue to deal with the devastating effects of COVID-19, we also continue to push into unknown and ancient frontiers of the earth. 
As the virus has spiked, so has deforestation, which puts our species at increasing risk for more novel infections. However, this is a topic that our keynote speaker will touch on more and with greater detail and expertise. While COVID-19 has brought great tragedy and heartbreak, we must always, which must always be acknowledged, it has also created new opportunities and new spaces to think, share, and be. Our virtual event today allows people from all over the globe to come together, to exchange, to learn, without the carbon footprint of planes, trains, and automobiles. Not to mention the large expenditures for the pub, but I think that's an aspect that we all dearly miss. While these are indeed unique circumstances, they have allowed us to create a workshop, which we hope brings together a wide variety of participants and speakers from a various array of backgrounds that might not have otherwise been possible. We hope the accessibility and cross-disciplinarity of this event will lead to more like it, and that the conversations had at this event will continue among both colleagues and friends after its conclusion. Thank you, May. Um, so the time for such an event couldn't be more appropriate. In the last few decades, the current unprecedented environmental crisis has led many scholars to rethink radically the anthropocentric model of political entities centered on the interaction between ideology, politics, economics, and the military. Instead, the focal role played by nature and environment in shaping social and political power is becoming increasingly recognized by scholars working across disciplines and time periods. This is extremely significant, not just in terms of research agenda. In fact, after a phase in the first half of the 20th century when humanist thinkers like Aldo Leopold and Lewis Mumford were deeply involved in the environmental discourse, the number of humanists among policy advisors faded. And with a few exceptions, scientists dominated the top level, levels of environmental science uh, planning for about 50 years. In the words of the Swedish historian Verken Sörlin, quote, if humanity is the chief cause of the ominous change, it must surely be inevitable that research and policy will be focused on human societies and their basic functions. After all, after half a century of putting nature first, it might be time to put human first. Thank you, Jack. Wow. Well, this may seem counterintuitive since humans have seemingly always put themselves or ourselves rather first. It is a good reminder that humans are the actors and that human, the element of humans, excuse me, that, human, that the human element of this crisis should not be forgotten in its science. While charts, graphs, and data are key for understanding what, how, and why, Humans must also navigate and negotiate these materials. While science is crucial for gathering, gathering data, the humanities are essential for helping humans turn this data into knowledge, into wisdom, and into action. Humans must be reintegrated into the narrative as more than just the cause. They must also be seen as a solution, since it will take a conscious collective effort if we wish to keep that doomsday clock from striking 12. However, in order to understand our way forward, we must also understand where we have been. Although the Anthropocene is a rather recent term in our discourse, it has numerous definitions all revolving around the dominant impact and effect that humans have had on the environment, ecosystems, and the climate. The Anthropocene can also be understood as a new geological epoch that is functionally and stratigraphically distinct from the Holocene. The Anthropocene dramatically confirms the overwhelming and irreversible influence that human activities have on our planet and show how we humans are a force of nature ourselves. The start date of this new epoch is highly debatable. Was it the Neolithic agricultural revolution, Greco-Roman mining operations, or the industrial revolution? These questions have obviously strong political implications as a very early date can be used to normalize environmental change. Although many scholars tend to place the beginning of this period at the beginning of the 20th century, excuse me, the middle of the 20th century, due to the long lasting traces of nuclear activity, the creation of plastics, and the heavy use of fossil fuels, Clear traces of human activity and influence on the environment were also present in Greco-Roman antiquity. One key marker of human activity in this period is the evidence from the Greenland ice cores, which show evidence of significant mining activity in the Greco-Roman world via traces of lead pollution trapped and preserved in the ice. While those traces are certainly less significant than current activities, as can be seen in the slide on the left-hand side here, um, they, are, they are still traces nonetheless. The mines themselves are also still visible, a deep scar on multiple landscapes throughout Europe. The mountains pictured here below 
in Spain, Las Madullas, have been stripped and down and quarried away, in this case, to extract gold, leaving one of many long lasting traces on the Earth's surface. The archaeological remains as well leave an imprint. Cities, infrastructure, and material remains of the Roman world, for example, here also endure in the archaeological and geological stratigraphic record and will remain, in certain cases, sealed in the anthropogenic layers we continue to create. Things like cities, roads, and aqueducts leave an infrastructural footprint that can last many thousands of years or more, while certain material culture, <clears throat> such as marbles, metals, and ceramics, will last even longer. See, for example, Monte Testaccio here, located at the bottom of your photo. A literal mountain made of amphora shirts deposited primarily in the second and third centuries AD next to the river Tiber that once contained oils and wines in transport vessels that were smashed after they had been emptied. As we can see here, this won't be going anywhere anytime soon. And you can see in some of these images right here to the bottom, that's just some of the quantity of amphora shirts that are seen here in the Monte Testaccio. Um, those layers right there on the right hand side are seen from the street um, where that arrow is coming from and on the far left there are some of the uh, Dressel 20 amphora that have been discovered that were brought from Spain for olive oil. Um, that's just some of the stratigraphy, which is basically all one unit. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. The creation of the city itself can also certainly be seen as something of a marker for the impending Anthropocene as humans or rather the homo species lived in nuclear families or family sets for several millions of years prior to agglomerating into larger settlements roughly 10,000 years ago. The process of urbanization, which is the movement of people from the country into cities, had a significant impact on the ancient understanding of nature and its exploitation. With surpluses now in order, each individual was no longer required to work the land to feed themselves, freeing up time and energy for other endeavors. While this created entirely new activities and economies, it also broke down the firm from farm to table link that humans had with their consumption practices as markets took hold and many urban inhabitants became increasingly detached from their food sources and the methods of their attainment. While cities broke down the human connection to land and to nature, there was the source of which was the source of everything used in daily life. They also increased production throughout agglomeration economics, which created which created knowledge spillovers and infrastructural savings due to increased density and interaction. In this sense, cities can be seen as social reactors from a very early period, burning hot and dense with energy and activity that was often fed by extractions from hinterlands, both near and far, depending on the size of the settlement. In fact, the physical fabric of the city, both ancient and modern, is a direct physical expression of, it, of its extractive activities, such as mining, logging, and clay quarrying, among others. As cities grew, so did extraction whether for sustenance, building materials, or precious metals and stones. Indeed, the creation of new urban economies is perhaps one of the biggest indicators of the impending Anthropocene, as this triggered the exploitation of the natural environment for financial gain on a scale that was previously unimaginable. Although the city today is more essential than ever due to our need for increased density and agglomeration with rising populations and continual hinterland destruction, like the deforestation we've seen above, it has also become a spatial fix for capital a place to put and make money. This has in turn led to great suffering for humans, animals, and the natural environment as a whole. In sum, the modern city could be considered the apogee of the Anthropocene today, as its dominant influence over the natural environment stretches far beyond its imposing physical footprint. Today, cities serve as the shells through which and by which capital exchanges occur, and the ripple effects of these transactions can be felt all over the world. As such, the history of the city is an important component of the history of the Anthropocene. Thank you very much, Matt. I'll, I'll now move on to another aspect of the workshop today. So while we were starting planning the conference back in autumn 2019, I remember doing a lot of reading about the Anthropocene and the current climate uh, crisis. And I remember the growing feeling of despair that, that was slowly getting hold of me day after day. I was overwhelmed and I needed a way out. I therefore started working on a series of digital paintings where I tried to convey some of the turmoil of feelings I was going through. And you can see a brief selection of them here. Art, art helped me to find some peace, to process and transform my fears into something positive. 
This personal experience convinced me that this workshop should reflect the crucial role played by artists in opening our eyes about climate change and at the same time to give us hope. In the words of the American poet Toni Morrison, crisis is precisely the time when artists go to work. There is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we, we write, we do language. That is how civilizations heal. The original idea was to organize a small exhibition displaying the artwork uh, at a local museum in Dublin. After the pandemic ruined our plans, we, re we remain still very dedicated to finding the way to make the artist a key component of the event, as we believe that artists and academics together can leave a mark, they can make a difference. For this reason, we decided to place uh, the academic papers within 15 minutes conversation with artists who will who will virtually display their work. The artworks will also be showcased during our breaks. While this does not obviously have the same effect as a real exhibition, it certainly allows for more freedom and more accessibility. While I was looking for a place where we could display the artworks, I came across an exhibition of John O'Reilly, an Irish artist based in Dublin. Fascinated by his work, I asked him if he was interested in participating and he was so kind as to send us some great pictures of his, of his oil painting. As a former graffiti artist, John's early subjects were um, of areas he often painted graffiti in, including non-pedestrian environments such as the railway and abandoned sites. His recent paintings featured monolithic-like environments of asphalt and concrete, of fuel tanks, farms, and car parks, describing long pedestrian walks around vehicular infrastructures. John will tell us more about his work during our first conversation with an artist. Considering the important role that the current environmental crisis plays in some of, the um, in some of these works of Marty Corman, we invited him to participate and we are delighted to have him with us today. Born in Barcelona, Marty now lives and works in Brooklyn. He creates hyperrealism works in Trompe-Lolet where reality coexists with the artificial. These two incredibly realistic artworks that you've just seen here are part of his project Offside, which focuses on the act of dislocation. In his own words, he sourced imagery online of both natural landscapes and built environments before inserting abstract forms that suggest nanotechnology and microscopic in 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 interventions. Marty will, lead, will talk about his more recent works and will share his thoughts about the environment during his talk later today. And just to remind, these are uh, not photos that have been photoshopped in any way. This is oil on linen, and the one before that was graphite and gouache. So these, uh, these are quite spectacular works. Um, to enrich our pool of artists back in 2020, we included in our call for papers a section dedicated to artistic contributions, and we received some fascinating proposals. This, for instance, is one of the floral head wreaths created by Patty Baker, who is both an academic and an artist. Patty works with ancient Roman floral techniques that modern florists can employ in order to create more sustainable designs. Her original idea was to showcase recreations of Roman flower crowns and garlands in both finished and unfinished forms, of which you see two examples here. Patty will be our third artist in residence today. We also received an interesting proposal by Sabrina Colabella, another academic who also works as an artist. As an academic, Sabrina is particularly interested in the different natures of the earth. Her materiality, as well as her religious and mythological implications in antiquity. As an artist, she usually works with clay and watercolors. And as you can see from this collage, her work reflects her fascination with the natural world. In particular, this collage is an attempt to represent the relentless ability of nature to regenerate herself and to take back control over our frail world of concrete. So among the recent studies on the ancient world that try to draw from both science and the humanities, the works of Donald Hughes, William Harris, Kevin Walsh, and Kyle Harper stand out for their impact and comprehensive scope. In a significantly revised and expanded second edition of Pan's Travail, uh, entitled Environmental Problems of the Greeks and Romans, Hughes offer a detailed look at the impact of humans and their technology on the ecology of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean basin. Harris, the ancient Mediterranean environment, and Walsh, the archaeology of Mediterranean landscapes, try to bridge the intellectual and methodological gaps 
between ancient history and the paleo environmental sciences. Similarly, Harper's successful The Fate of Rome combines different research methodologies used by climate, environmental, and biological scientists to emphasize the importance of environmental factors in the study of the evolution of ancient societies. On the other hand, scholars like Christopher Schlipake and Jason Koenig have tried to integrate the cultures of antiquity into ecocritical theory and practice. The relatively recent concept of ecocriticism was famously defined by Cherry and um, Glotfelty as the study of the relationship between literature and the physical environment. In this sense, ecocritical approaches look both at nature aesthetic dim dimension and at its impact on cultural practices. Uh, Schlipake, uh, Schlipake's The Environmental Humanities and the Ancient World reevaluates ancient texts and tradition and traditions in light of contemporary environmental theory, offering some stimulating insight into the ecological turn in classical studies. Koenig, on the other hand, has, has published extensively on literary re-elaboration of, uh, of ancient landscape and is the co-founder and assistant director of the Center for Ancient Environmental Studies at the University of St. Andrews, which aims, which aims to facilitate the interdisciplinary study of human interaction with the environment and their representations in antiquity. His forthcoming Mountain Dialogues from Antiquity to Modernity, co-edited with Don Hollis, aims to highlight the relevance of ancient understandings of mountain environments to the post-classical and present-day world. So building on the ongoing environmental human interdependency debate, this workshop will look back at the environmental impact of some of the largest power networks of the past, including ancient empires, with the aim of re-examining ancient perception of nature, power, and power over nature. At the same time, we will also um, we will see how Greek or Roman authors engage with the natural world using concept of contemporary environmental theory to look at ancient literature. We start from ancient Greece with the first session, Greek nature. Our speaker will engage with key texts such as Aeschylus, Prometheus Bound, and Aristotle, Aristotle's uh, ethics. Richard Hatkins will reevaluate Prometheus' speeches about civilization, arguing that what the Titan gives humans is not so much technological things as a technological way of looking at nature. Enrico Postiglione's paper will instead draw on Aristotle's conception of techne to reflect on the current nature technology debate. In the second session of Beast and Man, Dimitrios Papadopoulos will explore the intersection between animal nature and empire in the works of Pliny the Elder and Ilion. Dimitrios sees a connection between the fascination generated by the use of wild animals in the Roman arenas and the creation of encyclopedic works on their wondrous nature. Then Costanze Schiemann will expand further on this topic with her paper on animal hunts in late antiquity using literary literary and visual sources to chart Christian opposition to the use of animals in the arena. In session three, sexual nature, Thomas Morrow will propose an ecocritical reading of Catullus 64, his so-called little epic poem. Thomas emphasizes the poet's proto-ecological perspective. Man's exploitation of the natural environment is to blame for sub subsequent negative effects on human, on human interactions. Razabelle will then look at the literary relationship between artistic technologies and nature in Greek and Roman literature, comparing three female figures, Pandora in Isiod Theogony, Cynthia in Propertius Monobiblos, and Eburna in Ovid's Metamorphosis. The fourth and final session, Environment and Collapse, is dedicated to the impact of ecological transformation on ancient societies. Um, uh, Jill, Gambesh, Bill Gambesh, sorry, will address the sudden prosperity and collapse of the Negev, a desert region of southern Israel in late antiquity, focusing, focusing on environmental stressor to determine local resilience to climate change. Finally, our keynote speaker, Kyle Harper, will analyze the links between environmental changes and the spread of disease in antiquity in a paper entitled Microbes and the Ancient Anthropocene. <laughs> 